Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is brought to you by Kevin's Daily Newsletter. The Daily Newsletter is a short email delivered Monday through Friday, written to inspire, engage, and focus you on becoming the best person and leader you can be. Learn more and sign up at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash daily. And now here's your host, Kevin. Good morning and welcome everybody to another episode of live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Glad you were here. Have a couple of questions for you before we get started. Question number one, when was the last time you thought about complacency? More pointedly, are you complacent now? What about your team? Any members of your team complacent now? Do you even know? And perhaps how can you make sure that performance continues to improve even when you're experiencing success? Those are the kinds of things we're going to talk today about on the next live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I am so glad that you're here. And if you're with us here live on one of the various platforms where we are, uh, please say hello. Uh, Tell us where you're from. Let us know that. We'd love to know and be able to say hello back to you. And while you're here, I hope that you imagine that you're joining my guest, who I'll introduce in a second, and I for a cup of coffee. So if you've got questions or comments or ideas, just ask them. I'll see them and they'll make for a better conversation and eventually a better podcast. Speaking of the podcast, if you aren't here live, you could have been here long ago when we did this live. So in the future, you could join us to get future live episodes and interact with us and our guests and just see the information, get the ideas sooner. And you can do that by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. And so without any further ado, I want to bring in my guest and I will introduce him. Oh, before I do that, one more thing. Today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. Each of our masterclasses is designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human being you were born to be. You can learn more about how to get on board for a specific skill or stay in contact with that and get discounts in future uh, for future, po- excuse me, future masterclasses by going to remarkablemasterclass.com. Com. Hope you'll do that. And now, without any further ado, let me bring in my guest. Here he is. His name is Len uh, Hurstein, and and I want to tell you about him. He knows the danger of complacency, since I mentioned that already. He just wishes he had learned about it sooner. Uh, Now, as a keynote speaker and author of the new book, Be Vigilant, Strategies to Stop Complacency, Improve Performance, and Safeguard Success, he's on a mission to empower organizations and individuals to protect the success they've worked so hard to achieve. He has a 30-year history history in business, marketing, and entrepreneurism. Uh, he's worked in brand management for Coca-Cola, the Campbell Soup Company, Nabisco, before founding Manage Camp, a business conference producer. In 2015, he became a reserve sheriff deputy in Douglas County, Colorado, where he lives. He quickly learned that he was learning valuable lessons through his law enforcement training that applied directly back to business. We'll get to some of that today. The most important lesson, and the the very first one he learned, was the concept that complacency kills and vigilance saves. Len, welcome. Hey, thanks, Ken. I appreciate it. Wow. Never get used to hearing that. That's always uncomfortable (laughs) for me. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, you know, I typically ask people this question. Uh, when we start, Len, and I, I'm, again, I'm so glad that you're here. I typically ask this question. So tell us about your journey. But specifically today, I want you to tell us the story. What led you to decide, busy business career, what led yeah. you to decide to become a reserve sheriff's deputy? And what yeah. does that entail? No, that's a good question. It's it's uh, it's interesting because it's not something that I always wanted to do. It's not like I always wanted to be a cop, you know, um, but you didn't grow up watching Matt Dillon saying, I want to be, no, I'm sorry. I, I grew up watching this stuff and I had friends who were police officers and stuff. I just, I just never, you know, it wasn't something where it was like a lifelong dream of mine or anything like that. And it wasn't something that, that I had thought a lot about, but, you know, I got to this point in my career where I was thinking, man, you know, I really, there's, there's, there's gotta be something more. And I, and I wanted to be 
you know, giving to community and giving to society and, and things of that sort. And my wife is very heavily involved in, in uh, volunteerism and with Girl Scouts and, and things of that sort. And so I was looking for something. I wasn't pulling my weight. So I was looking for something. And then as I saw this Facebook post come out from uh, Douglas County Sheriff's Office here in Colorado, and they were they were holding they were putting together an academy for reserves for for this this thing. And, and uh, you know, it just kind of spoke to me. It was it was kind of something that awoken this kind of thing that I was like, man, that, that could be really cool. I'd really enjoy that. And so I went to I, I went through the whole process. I had to get, you know, all through the same hiring process that a normal deputy would go through all the psychological testing, which my wife now thinks is faulty and all these other things. And then that is not the topic of today's conversation. We're not, we're <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> well, she thinks, yeah, most people think I'm crazy for doing this for free, especially in this environment. But uh, but I went through the whole thing. I went through the whole academy, went through 440 hours of field training. And I am a certified peace officer in the state of Colorado. When I go out um, and, and do shifts, I do, you know, I work just like a regular deputy. I just don't get paid for it. I do it for free. So that was, uh, it was, it was just something that came about. It was, it was, I was in the right place at the right time. And, and, uh, and I love it. I've been doing it for almost seven years now. That's awesome. And and so I have to tell you, you and I were talking before we started uh, about, um, you, you asked me what I thought of the book. And I said, well, I read the book. That's why you're here. Uh, <laughs> and I have to tell you that all sorts of stuff come across my desk uh, for people that want to be on the show. And and we're honored that people do that and want to be on. Uh, I had never seen a leadership book in my life that had the word vigilant on the ti- on the cover, let alone as the title. So the, the title of the book, again, is Be Vigilant. So my question is, why vigilant? Yeah. Well, so it's interesting. You know, you mentioned in, in the intro that one of the first things I learned was this idea of how complacency kills. And we this is a constant theme throughout, you know, your entire career in law enforcement. We're always trying to understand what complacency is and how do we identify it and, and fight it. And we do it in certain ways. And, you know, coming with, you know, my at the time, 25 plus years of business experience, I was coming with a different lens than a normal, you know, 21 year old, 22 year old recruit would have. Um, and so as I was sitting there, I was thinking, you know what? Complacency kills businesses. It kills brands. It kills personal relationships. Um, and, you know, I started thinking about what is complacency, right? And most people look at complacency and think, think it's laziness, right? Sometimes that gets used, you know, as the same, you know, being complacent or being lazy, but really complacency is an overconfidence. It's a self-satisfaction. It's a smugness that leads to an unawareness of danger, right? And so when we look at it that way, then people start thinking, well, what's the opposite of that? Paranoia? And that's where that's where this, this idea of vigilance comes in, because the opposite of complacency is not paranoia, it's vigilance. And the difference between the two is that paranoia is based in fear and vigilance is based in awareness. And that's what the vigilant mindset is all about. It's all about you know, designing the processes in our life and our business that allow us to remain aware so that we can plan accordingly, we can be uh, prepared for things, we cannot get you know, surprised by threats that seemingly come out of nowhere. This awareness base is where the vigilance concept comes from. And I love that. And I don't think I don't think it's something that we talk about nearly enough in sort of the rest of the business world. And, and certainly in your your uh, your main professional focus around branding, we can all sort of look at other people and say, oh, yeah, well, they got complacent or this or that. But I really want us to ask this question about ourselves and mm-hmm. about our teams. And so let's talk about that word complacency a little bit more, not because it is about laziness. And I don't even, I mean, it's interesting that people might say that or might think that, but I just think of it as like smugness, satisfaction, whatever. Like, how do we start to notice this? Let's start first in ourselves. Well, yeah. How, how do we, I guess you would say, how do we be vigilant against our own complacency? What is your advice here? Yeah. So the, this is the, you know, the most insidious part of complacency is the fact that it's born out of success, right? So you don't find a lot of bootstrapping startups, maxing out credit cards in their parents' garage that you would describe as complacent, right? Complacency comes from success. 
And success breeds confidence, which breeds overconfidence. And that's when complacency comes up. So, you know, the danger of complacency is it's very hard to see. You know, we, it's easy for us to point it out in, in the, in, you know, in the post era, right? It's easy for us. We see it a lot in, in, in this time frame, right? We see it a lot, you know, in sports. We see it a lot in, in a lot of different things where in the back end, people say, well, we're getting complacent or we got complacent. The trick is how do you identify that, right? And stop it before it becomes something dangerous. And so that that's what the book is really all about. It's, it's all about, you know, how do you, you know, build these things into your life and into your work that allow you to stay ahead of that complacency, to not allow that overconfidence to settle in. And so, you know, the, the, the first question, the first part of that question, I think is like, how do, how do we know if we're being complacent? Well, here's a good, you know, here's a good litmus test. Are you successful, right? Because if you are experiencing success in your life, it is very likely at some place, whether it's with your family, whether it's with your friends, whether it's, you know, at work, uh, with your competitors, with whatever's going on, there's a good chance that you're being complacent somewhere because that is our nature. Our nature is to try and make life easier for ourselves, right? And that that's a good tip, right? So if you're experiencing success, it's a good time to step back and say, okay, where am I dropping the ball? Where am I, where am I letting things go? You know, at work, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is threat awareness, right? And, and the idea, and this is something that we learn in you know, in law enforcement is how do we make sure that we're staying aware of all the threats that are around us? 360 degree view, right? And so, you know, at work, a lot of times what can happen is we can become so focused on one or two or three competitors that we become very comfortable with our ability to understand those competitors, to compete with them, right? But I call that the Wiley Coyote or the Roadrunner effect, right? It, it, you know, for people uh, of a certain age, remember the Wiley e. Coyote and, and Roadrunner commercials and Wiley e. Coyote spent all his time worried about the Roadrunner and never ever did the danger that befell Wiley e. Coyote ever come from the Roadrunner, right? <laughs> Over the cliff, something falls on him, whatever. Right. right. So, uh, and for all of you that are too young uh, to know <laughs> Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner, just Google the Roadrunner car uh, cartoons. You will you'll find them humorous at any age. I believe. Um, so uh, I, I love that thinking. And you're right. I asked that big question kind of uh, on the, the front end as a way. It really is what you're trying to do with the entire book. So what I want to do now is pull some things uh, that I took from the book that I, I'd like for you to expand on and expound on and really to encourage people uh, to think more seriously about. So one of the things that you brought up, I'd never heard of before. Um, and it's what you call the OODA loop. Mm -hmm. I think I said that right. Yes. Because you said in the book, it, rem it rhymes with Gouda. So exactly. the OODA <laughs> loop. So what is this? I guess two part question. What is it? And how can it help us? Yeah, I love the OODA loop. And once you hear and read about the OODA loop, it's something that, that you'll find yourself coming back to all the time. It's a, it's an acronym. It stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. O-O-D-A, observe, orient, decide, and act. And it, it was something that was developed in the military to help uh, describe and understand how fighter pilots in the Korean War could be more successful, how they could, you know, win their battles uh, more often and stay ahead of their competition the people, the other people trying to fight right. them. Right? right. And so what they, what they figured out is that we all go through this OODA loop. This is the decision-making process. And you think about it in, in anything that you do in life, we observe what's going on. We orient ourselves to what's happening. We make a decision as to what we're going to do. And then we act. And the, where the OODA loop comes in, in terms of what I talk about in a book is how do you interrupt someone else's OODA loop? How do you interrupt your competitor's OODA loop, right? Because when you're not thinking about that, it becomes very easy for your competitor to figure out a way to attack you, right? So think about it in terms of sports. Uh, say, you know, whatever football you play, whether it's soccer or American football, whatever football, doesn't matter. At some point in time, someone has a ball and they're running towards a goal, right? And so as a defender, if that person is running straight down the field, you don't have to be a mathematical genius to figure out at what angle and at what speed you have to run to intercept them. 
It's pretty simple, right? We can all do it. Now, once that person starts, you know, moving and, and, you know, and spinning and changing their direction, that's when we see these kind of ankle breaking videos, right? Where someone's going one way and then they fall over themselves. And what's happening there is because every time that we get new information, our brain goes back to the start of the, of the OODA loop. Every time that defender is getting new information, they're having to reobserve, reorient, redecide, and react. And it slows down their OODA loop. And that's how you, that's a, you know, you can win the OODA loop by speeding up your own OODA loop. And we can talk about that too, or slowing down the other, the competitor's OODA loop. And so what we get into is this, this idea of don't stand on the X, get off the X. And when you're standing on the X, you become predictable. And when you're predictable, it's very easy for your competitors to quickly get through that OODA loop. They can observe, orient, decide, and act. They know exactly what you're going to do. If you run the same promotion every time, every year, if you you know react the same way to, to stimuli, it's going to be very easy to predict. So where the OODA loop comes into play is this idea of how do you become strategically unpredictable? How do you do things that give the competition, that give the market new and different information that it requires them to reprocess that before they can decide and act and slow them down. So it's all about getting off the X. Beautiful. I love that. So there are several other, and I, I really appreciate that. And I, I certainly, we can think about this from the, from the competitive perspective in terms of slowing down theirs, but I really love this idea of how do we speed up ours? How do we get better at really observing and orienting, right? I, I think those two things we have to get faster at. Because until we do that, we can't make good, we won't decide or we can't make good decisions, right? Yeah. Um, so I love that. And, and I've actually been writing a lot, Len, lately about this idea, about the, the, the link between deciding and acting. Uh, yes. not, not because I read the book, but it's connected to yeah. the book for sure. Um, so talk about, so there's a couple other things in the book that I really loved. Uh, this time of year, as we're having this conversation, of course, I know that people could be listening or watching this at any time, but right now it's early in the year as you and I are talking live. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless um, you. So habits is something you talk about in the book. It's certainly something for, if, if you're watching us live in January, um, you might, habits are sort of at the top of a lot of people's minds. How can we use, <laughs> excuse me, habits to help us get past our complacency and improve our performance. Yeah. So this was something that, that I learned directly from law enforcement, right? Which was, and it's not something that we talk about in this vein, but it's something that I saw that we do. One of the things that can happen to us and, and that where complacency comes in is where, you know, our thinking gets in the way, right? There are certain things that we should be doing that don't require thought. And when we think about them, right, they make us make mistakes. And so, you know, one of the things that, that I talk about in the book and then that, be, that really drove this home for me was this idea of, you know, shaking hands, right? So when I'm on duty, when I'm in uniform, I do not shake hands. It's a, it's a rule. It doesn't matter, you know, who you are or what, what, what you're doing. You know, I do fist bumps, right? Very easy because what I don't want to ever do is give up my hand to somebody who has bad intentions. Right. I don't want to give up control of a part of my body, especially, you know, I shake my hand, I shake hands with my right hand, which is also, uh, you know, my gun hand. Right. So, you know, I made a decision that I would only fist bump. Now, you know, where that comes into play is there are times where someone, you know, may reach out their hand. Right. Um, and they seem innocent enough. Right. And I don't know them. They don't know me. They want to shake my hand. And your instinct may be, to shake hands. Now, maybe you decide that I'm going to decide based on certain criteria, whether I'm going to shake hands or not, based on what they're wearing, based on how they look, based on what's going on around me at the time. The reality is- I already is, know them or a hundred other things, right? Right. Yeah. Have I come in contact with them, with them before, right? Or whatever it is. The reality is once you start trying to make those decisions based on what you think that criteria is, that's where your overconfidence comes in, right? Because you may- not have had an issue before, right? It doesn't mean you're not going to have an issue in the future. And eventually you're going to make the wrong decision. Eventually you're going to misjudge someone just by the way they look or the way they're acting at the time or what's happening around you. And that decision is going to be problematic, right? And so, you know, what I look for 
and especially, you know, you talked about New Year's resolutions, right? What I look for is where are the places where I can eliminate thought, where I can make a habit that doesn't require thought. So for example, say one of your New Year's resolutions is you want to uh, be a better parent or better, um, you know, spouse or partner, right? So there are things that you should probably be doing. You should probably be, you know, checking in more often. You should be, um, you know, asking questions. You should be learning about what's going on in their life. Now, if you just make that resolution and you decide, you know, on a day by day basis, based on what's happening, you're going to do that. That's probably going to fall by the wayside, right? Eventually you're going to go days without doing it and then it's gone. Now, what if you just scheduled that, right? So three times a week or four times a week at certain times in a day, I've got it in my calendar to talk to my kids, right? And ask them questions about what happened in their day, right? Now I'm not thinking about it now it's because really that's not something that should require thought, right? That's something that there's no downside to having it as a, as a habit, right? right? This right. is where when you build habits, you can avoid that overconfidence, right? That gets in the way of your thought process that makes you make wrong decisions in the moment, right? And so it, it applies to business and leadership too. The same, the same principles apply to business and leadership. What are, what are the things, one of the things I talk about, you know, in, in the book is, you know, from my world in marketing is creative briefs. You know, I used to find that what we would do is we would make a decision based on, you know, how big the project was or how complicated it was, whether or not we were going to do creative briefs. And then we would find that over and over again, we'd be disappointed with a lot of the creative we were getting us mostly on the projects where we weren't doing creative briefs because we didn't think that they deserve them. And how much time would those cost us in the long run, right? right? So what's the downside to just always doing a creative brief, right? Always doing it. If it's a simple one, you can do one really quickly, but you're getting your thoughts out ahead of time so that the person that you're asking to do the work knows what success looks like, right? That's a habit that you can build that avoids that overconfidence that makes poor decisions. I love that. You know, I think it's the last chapter. I don't I don't want to take the time to open it and check, but I believe it's the last chapter uh, in the book. You talk about a topic that I think all of us have mixed feelings about. Uh, we all know that these are important. And yet uh, you talk about metrics mm -hmm. uh, with an asterisk so to speak. So I'm going to, I want us to just have a conversation about this. It kind of goes what's in the book, but I just want to get your thoughts on this in general, like metrics and unintended consequences that come with the ones that we set. Yeah. Because I think it definitely leads to, and, and is connected to the complacency piece, of course, but let's talk about that a bit, because I think that th this was one of, I think the most um, interesting and useful parts of the book to me. So can yeah, we talk about awesome. that a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, the, the chapter is all about how metrics can lead to complacency, right? How we can misuse metrics. And, you know, we talk about this idea of unintended consequences. In my mind, unintended consequences are just consequences that happen that were not considered, right? So, you know, a lot of times we say, well, that was, you know, I didn't intend for that to happen. Well, we didn't think it through well enough to begin with. And that's why we had you know, what we call unintended consequences, right? Um, you know, the reality is that metrics can be super helpful in our business and in our lives, but they can also, if we use the wrong metrics or we use them incorrectly, can lead to an overconfidence, right? So, you know, for example, if we are measuring, you know, if we're a company that wants people to come to our website, right? And we're measuring the wrong things. If we're measuring, you know, the clicks, and we're measuring, you know, the number of people that visit the website, we might get really excited. We might look at that and be like, look how many people are coming. Look how many, look how good our emails are doing in terms of driving people to our website. The reality is if that doesn't lead to sales or that doesn't lead to what we want it to lead to, we can create an overconfidence, right? We can say our, our emails are super successful. Look at that, look at that open and click through rate. Right. And look at look at our website. Look at how many people are coming to our website. But how much time are they spending on a page? What are they doing? Are they doing the things that we want them to do in terms of actually getting through the funnel, getting to a sale? And so, you know, Eric Rees talks about, you know, this concept of vanity metrics. And that's that's a way that we can misuse metrics. Right. If we're using metrics that make us feel good, that give us information, that give us reasons to pat ourselves on the back. 
um, but don't actually lead to the success that we want, that's where we, we develop this overconfidence, this unawareness of the dangers that are lurking, right? So, so that's one way that metrics can, can kind of blind us, you know, especially at, at the upper management, right? If, you know, a lot of times we have these things happening where you've got, you know, the lower levels here and you got the upper management here and there's this disconnect. You know, the people down here see the problems that are coming, right? But the people up here don't see them. And that's because they're looking at the wrong metrics, right? They're getting the wrong information and it's making them overconfident, which is leading to that complacency. So that's one way that metrics can be, can go wrong. The other way that metrics can go wrong is when we create metrics that can be gamed, that, that, that sometimes we encourage people by the way we're incentivizing them to game the metrics, you know, and, and what I talk about in the book is the Cobra effect, right? Where in, you know, colonial India, they had a Cobra problem. And so they created a bounty for Cobras and they were going to pay, you know, a certain amount of money for the head of each Cobra that people found. Well, what happened was people started breeding Cobras, right? <laughs> they started breeding Cobras, releasing them. So they could kill them and get the bounty, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so then, you know, all of a sudden people figured out this is what was happening. So they did away with the bounty and now there were all these Cobras and they had way more Cobras than they ever had. Oh, we got before. a bigger problem than we had before. And trust me, everybody, that is not a problem I want to deal with personally. Right. Well, so here's <laughs> it's a similar thing related to snakes. They brought mongooses, mongeese, mongooses, whatever right word <laughs> is, to Jamaica. Is, yeah. To get rid of the snakes, they got rid of the snakes, and then they ended up with a bigger problem with the mongoose. Right. right? So and people would call that an unintended problem than the snakes caused. Right. Right. And people would call that an unintended consequence. Right. But that's just a consequence that they didn't consider. Right. That was something that if they had thought through, they would have said, mm, "Okay, is this metric gameable?" And that's what you want to ask whenever you're using metrics in your organization you want to ask number one is this a vanity metric or does this tell us something real that we can use that's actionable that that drives down to the end results that we actually want to see is it gameable and are we encouraging people to partake in the wrong behavior to meet the metric right that's that's those are those are two things you could be asking right now and then the third thing that i would ask that i would ask you to to look at with your metrics is how can you use fewer metrics we we tend to start like adding metrics on top of each other on top of each other until we've got so many things and we spend meetings every week going through all of our metrics and the reality is that you know if we can boil it down to the two or three or four that really tell us the story that allow us to take action and move quicker in our OODA loop like we talked about so all this is interrelated right yep those are those are three things you can do right now to look at how metrics might be you know adding to your complacency or creating a complacent workplace or home life are they gameable are they vanity metrics and are they even necessary? Perfect. Awesome. Um, I want to kind of come back almost to, to where I started before, as we start to round our way toward the home, toward home here. Um, you know, we talked about complacency being about uh, that it's, it's bred from success, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm guessing, I'm confident in your career, you've heard this. I've heard it a hundred times. Well, if we keep getting successful and all you do is keep raising the bar, we keep needing to moving forward. And that's about getting past complacency. But any final thoughts about balancing success today with the need for continued growth? Because I think, you know, in this age of people feeling burnt out and all those other things, I think it all connects to this. How do you, uh, what would your comment be about this specifically? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I think comes really into play with this that I talk about in the book is this concept of purpose and being able to articulate your why. Right. And I think when you are able to do that well, it continually pushes you forward. Right. So that you're always looking for for what's next, because, you know, what happens is a lot of us have mission, vision, mission and vision statements. Right. But what we really need is a purpose statement. We need to understand why we exist. Um, in life and in business. And in business, it's gotta be more than just making money, right? It's not just about making money. Why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? What do we represent to the world? And what are we trying to do in terms of leaving a mark, right? And so if everybody within that organization understands the purpose, then everything they do can be articulated in terms of why they're doing it to further that purpose. And that purpose, so you know what that purpose does is it creates something for us to keep going after, 
right? And so, you know, it, it prevents us from getting to this spot where we're, you know, we're just in this, like we've reached our success and we're good. You know, when you have a purpose, you're always reaching for more, right? You're always, you know, how do we, how do we do this better? Maybe your purpose, you know, is like Patagonia and, and it revolves around, you know, uh, you know, the ecosystem that you live in and making the world, you know, more sustainable and, 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 you know, better place. Well, that doesn't end when you sell a sweater, right? <laughs> you know, so, so it gives you something to keep, keep moving forward towards. Um, and, you know, that is something that I think goes a long way. You know, the other danger with success is that with success comes power and power breeds complacency because power, we get to the point where, you know, when you're, answer when someone asks why are you doing that is is because i can or because i said so those are two good ideas as to that the fact that you're being complacent in life and that only lasts for so long so you know with that success you want to make sure that you're also you know with that purpose then also building accountability and providing transparency and when you provide that accountability and transparency not only do you have you know the purpose that's driving you from within you also have this external pressure that you feel in terms of you've put that line in the sand in terms of what you're supposed right. to be doing Absolutely. that also keeps you moving in the right path 100% my team would all be nodding right now saying kevin that's what we we do all the time yeah. uh so uh len before we do start to to wrap up here my question is is there something i didn't ask that you wish i would have you know, no, you're a great interviewer. You've asked fantastic questions. I think the one thing that I would want to leave the audience with is that complacency is dangerous. It's always there, right? And we spend a lot of time figuring out how to get successful. Now, what vigilance is, is about how do we keep that success, right? How do we keep that success moving forward? It's not enough to just get there. Right. Because when you get there and you start building that that kind of, you know, comfort level and it doesn't mean, again, that you need to be paranoid and, and crazy all the time and over vigilant. But what you need to do is you need to build that awareness. And so, you know, anybody out there, you started by asking, like, how can we tell if we're complacent? The reality is you're complacent. Some you're it's somewhere in your life, somewhere it's something you're doing. You're being complacent. Now, you know, you got to do the cost benefit analysis as to whether that matters or not, where you're being complacent. Right. But. You know, at the same time, I would just, you know, encourage people to be more aware, be more intentional, right? And that's what the book is all about. The book is just about how do you build that awareness? How do you build that intentionality into your life, into your business, so that, you know, you don't fall to the pitfalls of, of complacency? All right, we're done talking about complacency. If that's possible, <laughs> uh, but I have a couple of questions about you. And, and the first one is, so what do you do? For fun, besides going and being a sheriff's deputy, like what do you do for fun? Yeah, you know, like my one kind of advice that I love to do is play poker. I'm, uh, I, I love to play poker, um, and you know, when I do get a chance, I don't get many chances these days. But when I do get a chance, that's what I like to do for fun. I'm guessing that vigilance helps you there. I'm just guessing. Not yeah. really a poker player, but I'm guessing that whole observe and orient piece of the OODA loop. Uh, well, the whole loop. Probably yes. is helpful, right? Absolutely. Um, so now the question I ask everybody, and the only question you knew that I was going to ask you, which is, <laughs> what are you reading these days? You know, so, you know, prior to writing my book, I've, I've run a conference for the last 19 years. So I've worked with a lot of authors and and uh, just blessed to to get exposed to a lot of, lot of different books. I think the ones that are top of mind right now um, is a, a book that just came out in September, I believe which is I'll Be Back by uh, Shep Hyken. So uh, Shep is a customer service and a customer experience uh, expert. And the book's all about, you know, how do you get those customers coming back, right? What do you need to do to get your customers coming back? Um, there's another book by, uh, by a friend of mine, named, uh, David Nearman Scott, three words, who yep, uh, wrote a book David. called Fanocracy. This is his latest book, which is all about, you know, how do you... Uh, you know, turn, uh, you know, loyal uh, customers into fans, right? And how do you, how do you create fandom within, uh, within your business, within your organization, uh, whatever you're doing? Those are, those are two, uh, two off the top of my head that I can recommend right now. Excellent. And of course, you want to recommend this. How can yes. people learn more? 
Where can people learn more about you? Get the book. Where do you want to point people? Yeah. So, you know, if, if all you want to do is get the book, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, wherever you buy books, you can just, you know, get it there. But if you want to learn more about the book, go to bevigilantbook.com. Um, and that is where you learn more about the book and what, it, what it's all about. You can also learn more about me and the book and all that at lenherstein.com. Um, and that's how you spell it right there. Or, you know, I just encourage people reach out to me on LinkedIn. I love, I, I connect with people, you know, not, not to sell me things, but uh, hopefully, but you know, don't, don't like, you know, reach out. And then as soon as I click, yes, start selling me things right away. Um, but I do love to connect with people on LinkedIn. Perfect. So, um, uh, Len Hurstein, dot com, be vigilant book.com. Now a question for all of you who are watching, whether live or later or listening is now what, what action are you going to take? What decision and action will you take now that you've had the chance to listen to Len for a few minutes? Maybe you want to spend more time thinking about and how you can apply the OODA loop. Maybe you need to rethink how you do metrics. Maybe you want to think about differently about the habits that you set and how they can help you overcome complacency. Len gave you some very specific things that you could do while the examples were in our personal life, the exact same examples could be used in our professional life as a leader or as a relationship builder. So I hope that you will all take some action as a result, because if you don't, sort of what's the point of having been here? Uh, if you found this episode helpful, I hope that you'll invite someone else to join us in the future. If you happen to be uh, listening or watching from Apple, I hope that you would give us a review. But if you're watching it in this, on a social media channel, of course, just Share it with your friends. We would love that. We'd be grateful for that. Uh, Len, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Be happy, be healthy, be safe, be vigilant. Be vigilant, everyone. And uh, you can be watching because I'll be back next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everybody.